All right, so we're going to get started. It's great to see everyone and everyone's shining faces. Great to be with all of you and great to be in community with all of you this morning. So we're going to get started with our prelude and our prelude is Zion's Walls from the Old, uh, old American Songs by um, Aaron Copeland. To the First Universalist Church of Rochester, where we are called to nurture the spirit and serve the community. Whoever you are, you are welcomed. Wherever you come from, you are welcomed here. Whomever you love, you are welcome here. Whomever you bring home or with you, you are welcome here. All of you is welcomed here. It is good to be together this morning and we acknowledge with respect the seneca nation keepers of the western door and part of the Haudenosaunee, so um, excuse me the Haudenosaunee people on whose ancestral lands first universalist now stands if you are here for the first time this morning we especially welcome you. We have a visitor's form um, that can be found in the chat. Please click, click on it and fill out the form so that we can offer you a welcome beyond this worship service. And as, there, as we gather this morning, we want to invite you to pop into the chat and offer a greeting. You can find this at the top or at the bottom of the screen with the icon of a text bubble and the word chat. So please pop on over and offer a greeting. It could be a quick wave of hello, or I'm here, or whatever you prefer. Welcome to worship at First Universalist. So good to be with all of you this morning. And as we are welcoming each other, let us join hearts and voices and singing together this morning, recognizing that even as we are singing muted in our own homes this morning, and we are, but we are creating a song across the city of Rochester, here in Montpelier, Vermont, across the country and the world. Let us sing together hymn 
317, we are not our own. We are not our own, earth forms us, human leaves on nature's growing vine, fruit of many generations, seeds of life divine. We are not alone, earth names us, past and present people near and far, family and friends and strangers shows us who we are. Therefore let us make thanksgiving and with justice willing and aware give to earth and all things living Liturgies of care. Let us be a house of welcome, living stone upholding living stone, gladly showing all our neighbors we are not our own. Welcoming the stranger is a custom common to many cultures. In the Bible, it is mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments. In Matthew, we are told the parable of the stranger who was hungry and whom we fed, who was thirsty and we refreshed, who needed assistance and we aided. The parable notes that inasmuch as we've done this for a stranger, so have we treated Jesus. In Hebrews, we are told not to neglect to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed angels without knowing it. Welcoming the stranger is a principle that First Universalist tries, strives to sustain. We want visitors to feel comfortable and hope that here with us, they have found what they have been seeking. We are, uh, we are a diverse congregation and welcome those who come from many backgrounds and customs. We span many religious beliefs from atheists to Wiccans and everything in between. We range from the very young to the not so young. We come from many parts of the United States as well as abroad. Many of us have relatives in other countries. We can trace or we can trace our lineage well beyond the boundaries of North America. We recognize that while we have much to offer to a stranger, we have much to gain from those we have yet to know and we welcome the experience. We know that we may have much in common, not least of which is the search for truth. Welcoming the stranger into one's home can be a bit more complicated. Others in our home may not be enthusiastic about welcoming the stranger. And then there are so many unknowns Rather than having the search for truth in common, we may need to search for common ground. Sometimes it can be a challenging experience. Today, we'll listen to our speaker's experience when he welcomed a stranger to dinner. Will this be an example of welcoming an angel without knowing it? I wonder. Come, let us listen as we worship together. 
Virtus LeVar Robinson is the Lenora Montgomery Scholar of Excellence at Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago, where he is in his final year of completing a Master of Divinity and has recently been named a candidate for the Unitarian Universalist Ministry. Currently, Virtus serves as the ministerial intern for the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, Vermont. Virtus was a confirmed local minister in the Holiness Pentecostal tradition prior to joining the First Universalist Church of Rochester, New York in 2008. Here, he served as a worship associate slash coordinator, lay preacher, member of the Committee on Ministry, choir member, soloist, religious education instructor, and a member of the social justice team. During his occupational career, Virtus was the national director for the Democracy Commitment, the director for community college engagement at Campus Impact Compact. He is currently an associate of the Kettering Foundation, specializing in deliberative democracy in community colleges and interfaith institutions. Prior to leading civic engagement nationally, he was a tenured assistant professor of history in African American studies at Monroe Community College here in Rochester for 10 years. Virtus holds many degrees. He has a bachelor's in music, a bachelor's of music in voice performance from Boston University a Bachelor of Science cum laude, and a Master of Arts in History from SUNY College at Brockport, and a Master of Arts in African American Studies from SUNY University at Buffalo. We are so pleased, Bruce, to have you back with us for a while. Now, as we light our chalice, which we will be doing shortly. We will light our chalice in church and in our own homes. Will you join me in saying our chalice words in unison? May we be a people of hope, a people of welcome, here to grow in heart and mind and spirit, and may we reach out to serve our community. Please join me now in our affirmation of faith, followed by our doxology. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity and fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the source and meaning of life. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all. This month's offering will be donated to the Center for Youth. The Center for Youth partners with youth to realize their full potential by creating opportunities, removing barriers, and promoting social justice. 
It offers free, confidential, and accessible service to youth ages 12 through 21, including counseling, intervention, outreach, transitional living programs, and many other programs. In our UUA Reading in the Living Tradition, Kendall Gibbons asks us, who are these children that we are mindful of them? And we are answered that they are our present delight. By them, we are reminded of life's small joys and wisdoms. What can we do for them? Among other things, we pledge them our love and support, a listening ear, and a helping hand in times of trial. These are certainly times of trial for all of us, but perhaps especially for our youth. With this offering, let us open our hearts and our pockets and offer them our helping hands. Please click the link in the chat to give online to First Universalist Church or feel free to send a check to the church.
Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh my goodness. Hmm, I miss y'all. I miss y'all. <laughs> I'm just saying. But for our story today, uh, we will be listening to a song from the musical Into the Woods by the late, great Stephen Sondheim, who died this past November. The song is sung by the One Voice Children's Choir, and the lyrics begin with, careful the things you say, children will listen. Careful the things you do, children will see and learn. Children may not obey, but children will listen. Children will look to you for which way to turn or learn what to be. Careful before you say, listen to me. It is truly a message for all ages. Please enjoy our story in song form. how stories, how songs tell stories that speak to our hearts. And speaking of our hearts, I now invite you into a reverent time of sharing the joys and sorrows of our gathered community. If you would like to, you can place a hand over your heart to be able to listen from this heart-centered place. As I place stones into a vase, I will read aloud the joys and sorrows of our gathered community, um, just so that you know 
a little bit of a change because it just works easier to make sure that we're not forgetting anyone. Um, if you email in your joy and sorrow, even by Sunday morning before like 8 a.m., um, the speaker who's sharing joys and sorrows can share them. But while we are online, you can also share your joy or sorrow in the chat. Um, I just can't necessarily read it in real time. So those are our options for, for sharing and listening to our joys and sorrows together here. We have a joy from Karen Labraco on Thursday. Karen and her husband, Bernie Labraco, celebrated their 49th wedding anniversary with a low key dinner at home. Next year, a big party. From Elizabeth Osta Asaro. My cousin Maureen died Thursday after a battle with COVID. Her family is relieved. Her suffering has ended. Our hearts are with you and your family, Elizabeth. From Michael and Kelly Scott. They are delighted and proud to share that their daughter Erin and her fiance Nick are planning a wedding for September. Congratulations. And a gratitude from Marty Eggers. I'm so grateful for the love and support of my church community that, has ex that they have extended to me these past weeks after the death of my dear brother-in-law. You all have carried me once again, and I thank you with all my heart. It is our joy to hold each other in our joys and our sorrows. And I'll drop one final stone into the water to represent the joys and sorrows left unspoken in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts. May all be held in the heart of love. Today, we white, light a white candle to acknowledge that we are a community affected by the grief, loss, and fear of living through a pandemic. May this candle's flame hold our experiences around this horrific disease. And may its light be a beacon of hope and a reminder that we are not alone. Please join me in a time of meditation and prayer. Take a breath and settle into the now, into this time and space that we make sacred with our intention and our gathering together. Spirit of life, ever adapting, and renewing. We come together this morning with yearnings that do not match. We yearn for stability, for even one moment of feeling like we know what is going on, for the ability to predict and prepare for what is coming next. Yet, we also yearn for change. We ache for a world that turns aside from racism, violence, dehumanization, and disregard for suffering. We pray for a change in the illness, grief, isolation, incarceration, and vulnerability of our loved ones. We search for connections that will remind us that we are worthy as we are. 
and as we reach for connections that will help us to become our best selves. Let us hold in the heart of both and cradle us in the mystery. Cherish us in the eternal presence of love and encourage us on the path of growth and development as individuals and as a people. Help us to become who we are called to be. Lead us to open pathways to deeper wisdom through reconciliation, self-respect and mutual respect, compassion, owning and making amends for our mistakes. Source of wonder. Move us to express and live in gratitude for the beauty of this world, the loving people in our lives, and this day of possibility. To this, we add the meditations of our hearts as we enter into a time of silence. May the silence we share continue to hold and to heal us. reading comes from uh, the Reverend Dr. Kristen Harper, and it's called, 
who is welcome. Everybody wants a seat at the table. Blacks, Latinos, Asians, the poor, the disabled, gays, lesbians. Where are all the straight, white, moderate men supposed to sit? I'm not prejudiced. I'm just asking. And what table are they talking about? My table only sits eight comfortably, and I have service for 10. That's it. So you'll just have to wait your turn. Can you imagine if you let anyone sit at our table? Why, we may have to have people who can't tell their salad fork from their dinner fork, or people who eat with their hands. I shudder to think. Anyone is welcomed at my table in my home. As long as you don't have grease stains on your clothes or wash your hands before you touch my silverware. Everyone is welcome at my table. As long as you don't try to proselytize me with your religion or your politics and don't get upset when I question yours. After all, it wasn't my faith that taught me to eat Jesus and drink his blood. Come on in, I say. And don't make fun of my Pan-African sculptures and paintings mixed with Tin Zikirio Precious Moments figurines. If you don't dress up and don't have every hair in place and you don't smell too fresh, you are welcome. Just don't sit on my good leather or the new futon cover. Here, let me get you a towel. I am told the outside shower works very well. Everyone is welcomed at my table, as long as you sit still and don't wiggle or interrupt the grown folks' conversations. Children should be seen and not heard, and they should dress up in bows and satin as they can entertain us. And don't worry if they aren't talented. It only reflects on your upbringing, not mine. Truth is, I really don't have room for you. Maybe next time. Right. So, who has seen the classic movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Hands up, wave your hands if you've seen it. Okay, a few of you, a few of you, okay. Well, it debuted in 1967, and it was very controversial but timely. It starred the recently deceased Black American actor, Sidney, Sidney Portier, the first Black actor to receive an Oscar award for a leading role. He was also a civil rights activist and now a patron saint of mine. He, start, he starred in this romantic comedy in which he desired to ask the father of his lover for her hand in marriage, very traditional. They were going to do it over dinner and he was the guest. However, he was black and she was white and from an upper class liberal-minded white family. Again, this was 1967. The film was one of the few, a few films at the time that depicted an interracial relationship in a positive light, as miscegenation historically had been illegal in most states in America. In fact, when the film was finished, it was still illegal in 17 states, mostly Southern states, and that lasted until all anti-miscegenation laws were struck down by the Supreme Court in Loving versus Virginia in June of 1967, the same year the film debuted. In an interview many years after its release, Sidney Poitier reflected how possible it was to make a film like that in America at that time. He said that it was close to impossible. Primarily people, the industry was not ready for such type of a film, he said. But in talking with the director, Stanley Kramer, Portier quoted Kramer, I would like to make a film like this, not because it is going to be sensational, not because it is going to be provocative, but because I'm a filmmaker in America and this is part of America. And if I use this format, I can speak to the humanity in people. To make a long story short, the romantic comedy showed how each person navigated their relationships with each other and their feelings on the matter, eventually bowing to the power of love, including his parents and her mother, 
but with one holdout, her father. However, in an honest exchange between Sydney's mother and her father, the father was convicted of something. He was reminded that love is love, is love, is love, amen. Before the families adjourned to the dining room for dinner, the father gave a moving monologue, saying that although the pair would face enormous problems and challenges ahead due to their racial differences, they must find a way to overcome them, and he will approve the marriage, knowing all along he had no real right to stop it. But it was deeper than that. In his message of affirmation, her father said to his black parents, there is nothing, absolutely nothing that your son does not feel for my daughter than I did for Christina, who was his wife for over 20 years. The only thing that matters is what they feel and how much they feel for each other. And if it's half of what we've felt, that's everything. It was a classic and poignant moment where everyone witnessed were, were there with tears in their eyes, the power of love that was more powerful than fear, more powerful than prejudice, more powerful than disappointment. Love came to dinner that evening. It left me with a message that in cultivating relationships, honesty and openness are key players. Honesty, authenticity, and being true to who you are and who you have become. Being honest with your feelings, but open to the power of love. Open to the love that you have for yourself and open to the love for whomever you are cultivating a relationship with. Honesty and openness are key players. African-American poet and openly gay man, one of my other patron saints, James Baldwin once said, the moment we cease to hold each other, the moment we break faith with one another, the sea engulfs us and the light goes out. Where does that take you? What do you feel or see when you hear that? I read it one more time. The moment we cease to hold each other, the moment we break faith with one another, the sea engulfs us and the light goes out. For me, it speaks to the experience that I had in growing in a relationship with myself first, then with others that I care about and making sure to hold them close in faith that my heart won't be broken by them. To hold them also to be held by them in love and care. To hold and to be held in authentic reciprocity. Then and only then will I not worry about the sea engulfing us, the waves of life splitting us apart and extinguishing the light between us, the flame that we burn in our hearts for each other. Pandemic time is teaching us so many things about our relationships. What have you learned? For me, my friendships are weeded out and realigned. I had to prioritize those that are essential over those that were convenient and strategic. Some didn't last, some didn't grow. Others with authentic reciprocity did. Maybe it took a slowing down to realize this. Well, friends and family, I want to tell you a brief story in which I too had a guess who's coming to dinner experience. I was there at the age of 32 years old and I was bringing home um, someone to my family dinner for the first time. It was Thanksgiving dinner 11 years ago. Um, and I 
was a bold and it was a bold and courageous move as I was essentially coming out to my family as the guest dinner for the guests for dinner was not of a different race, but of the same gender, my first boyfriend. Two years prior, I had resigned as minister in a Black Holiness Pentecostal church, began to live my truth, became a Unitarian Universalist, and now I had the audacity of bringing a gay lover to dinner. It was somewhat of a blur. But I believe in the power of love, authentic reciprocity in relationships to get me through that day. For you see, my father is a holiness Pentecostal preacher like I was. And so are two of my sisters. My brother is retired um, from is retired from the Air Force, and my nieces and nephews were all raised in the church just like their parents and just like I was. A church that believed that my lifestyle was a ticket to hell. My mother had dementia, so my siblings and I oversaw the planning, the food, and, and I cannot cook, if anyone knows me. But he could. He made the best baked ziti, and I do have the recipe if anybody wants it, by the way. And my family inhaled it. But I can still remember, remember everyone's reaction when I introduced him. My father smiled and shook his hand and then showed him his Hawaiian guitar. <laughs> My sister smiled and welcomed his contribution to the meal and begged for the, for, the, for the recipe. My brother smiled and talked to him as well. All smiles so far, I'm kind of concerned and worried, but surprised. <laughs> Even my nieces and nephews gravitated to him. I think my nieces thought he was fine. They all instantly became Facebook friends with him. I was shocked and amazed. Was this the power of love? The only holdouts were my brother-in-laws. They did not greet him or talk to him. They both sat on the couch in the den next to each other with their arms folded, looking down when I entered into the room. I could tell that I was ruining their Thanksgiving, but at least I knew how they felt. It was hard and, and sad to see, but I did not lose faith in them as James Baldwin warned. And besides, again, honesty is the key player and their honest reactions were key. Now openness, that's a different story. Nevertheless, I had expected my whole family to be like them, but they weren't. It felt amazing. I felt seen, heard, and held for the very first time in my life. Now I realize that this is not true for everybody. I see, it seemed like it was easy for me, but it truly wasn't. I didn't know what to expect, and I worried that it'll be a very short visit. But years later, it turns out that one of my sisters, who had I had come out to many years before that, that visit, that dinner, had warned everyone weeks prior, guess who's Virtus is bringing to dinner? He's bringing his boyfriend. <laughs> this allowed them time to reflect on their love and care for me, to sit with it and to sit with their feelings. It wasn't a shock or a surprise to them, but it reminds me of a biblical scripture that I'm gonna quote from the inclusive Bible, yes, there's a such thing, of 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the first of the eighth verses, and it says, love, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not put on airs, and it is not snobbish, it is never rude or self-seeking, it is not prone to anger, nor does it brood over injuries. Love doesn't rejoice in what is wrong, but rejoices in the truth. There is no limit to love's forbearance to its truth, its hope, its power to endure. Love never fails. Love does not rejoice in what is wrong, but rejoices in the truth. That is how we are able to grow in relationship. Religion told them that I was wrong, but love rejoiced in my truth. 
But living and being honest about my truth was no easy feat. It wasn't as it isn't for many queer people in our society. That is still largely against what is deemed normal, what is deemed right, what is deemed sacred. Some never cultivate relationships with their families because of this. Some never even accept themselves. It was difficult as a minister of the gospel to live my authentic self. But what gave me the audacity, the courage, the strength, and the power to do so? I was first welcomed by my chosen family, my you, family and i was welcomed literally with open arms and yes first universalist church of rochester i am talking about you picture it 2008 a pride banner to stand on the side of love proudly displaced in front displayed in front of the church welcomed me but the church ladies during coffee hour affirmed me and you know who you are many of you are on this call right now after hearing where i had come from and me jokingly telling them that my previous faith believed that i had a sinful evil spirit in me compelling me to live an immoral life of sin and degradation they held me now this was long before COVID, so they physically and spiritually held me and whispered affirmations in my ear and told me that nothing was wrong with me, that I was loved and that I was safe. You embodied the first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person because we believe that each and every person is important and it saved my life. Not only that, but I was able to go on a journey of healing and self exploration with the fourth principle a free and responsible search for truth and meaning for we believe that each person must be free to search for what is true and right in life. These principles and living them gave me hope gave me courage and strength to live my authentic self and to heal. It gave me courage to discover what was important, who was important, and to be held by them and to hold them close. If not my biological family, then definitely my chosen church family. First Universalist Church of Rochester, do you realize that you saved me? that you were living the universalist belief in a collective salvation, that you were not only wel welcoming me and welcoming congregation, but affirming congregation. But more is required right now. More is needed right now. Keep doing that and do it more than ever before. Do it with intention as our lives, our souls, and our dreams, and our principles depend on it. So let us continue to be honest and open with each other. Let us continue to hold each other in care and support and be held by this community. Let us continue to welcome and affirm everyone who comes our way and let the spirit and the power of love keep us together and guide the way as we lean on each other and build a new way. Amen, Ashe and blessed be. Whew. Our final hymn is hymn number 1021 in the Till Hymno, Lean on Me. We invite you to remain muted and sing out joyfully from home. I wanna hear you all the way in Vermont. <laughs> and again, create a collective song from wherever we find ourselves. Sometimes in our lives we all have pain we all have 
As we extinguish our chalice flame this morning, let us read together the words printed in your order of service and on the screen. We extinguish the, this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with this message of love and justice, taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. And though we cannot be seated next to each other, we are still and feel connected in this community. And as we come to the uh, to, uh, close of our service, I want you to, to invite, invite you into an embodied practice of, of holding um, from a distance uh, hands at the end of the service. You all know how to do it by now. Um, or welcome back to doing it. <laughs> and if you are and you are joining us by a video, so please uh, change your view to gallery view at this time, rather than speaker view. So we can see each other and I can see all of you because I miss all of you and thanks for welcoming me back into the fold. Uh, for folks um, here on the phone, place your hand over your heart and bring to mind someone that you love, which won't be hard to do from this congregation. And um, as I um, say um, our benediction, 
Spirit of life and love, dear God of all nations, there is so much work to do. We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Help us hold fast to our vision of what can be. May we see our hope and our history and find the courage and the voice to work for that constant rebirth of freedom and justice. That is our dream. Amen. And that is from the words of another mentor of mine, the Reverend Bill Singford. Um, let's see. And let the people of the church say amen. <laughs> Forgot about that part. Yes, amen. Now, uh, make sure that you join us um, after the service for 10 minutes for a special listening session with the COVID task force and the board. Um, and so as we come to the final uh, close of our service, I invite you to follow the benediction, this benediction with the words, I am loved, I am affirmed. Again, I am loved, I am affirmed, and truly believe it, believe it. So please join us in typing these words into the chat or say it out loud and in your heart, I am loved, I am affirmed. And as we are doing that, it's been a pleasure being with all of you again. We'll be together again, trust me. But now, please enjoy the postlude, Rainbow Connection, sung by myself. You didn't think you were going to get a two for one, right? <laughs> but um, sung by myself, but with a tribute to the late Sidney Portier. Please enjoy Rainbow Connection as the postlude, and be well, my friends and family. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? And what's on the other side? Rainbows are visions, but only illusions. And rainbows have nothing to hide. And some choose to believe it I know they're wrong Wait and see Someday we'll find it The rainbow connection The lovers, the dreamers and Answered when wished in a morning star. Somebody thought of that and someone believed it. Look what it's done so far. What's so amazing that keeps us stargazing when what we think we might see someday we'll find it the rainbow connection the lovers the dreamers and me all of us under its spell we know that it's probably magic. Have you been half asleep? And have you heard voices? I heard them calling my name. Is this the sweet sound? Calls the young sailors the voice that might be one and the same. I heard it too many times.
sometimes to ignore it. It's something that I supposed to be. Someday we'll find it. The rainbow connection. The lovers, the dreamers, and me. 